The year was 553 AD, a time of great turmoil and transformation in the ancient world. The city of Constantinople, the beating heart of the Byzantine Empire, played host to a gathering of immense religious significance, the Second Council of Constantinople. This city, with its grand architecture and bustling streets, was the epicenter of both political and religious power. This assembly, the fifth ecumenical council recognized by most branches of Christianity, convened to address lingering theological controversies that threatened the unity of the Christian world. Bishops and church leaders from far and wide gathered, bringing with them the weight of their respective traditions and beliefs. The Council's decisions would have far-reaching consequences, shaping the future of both Eastern and Western Christianity. The debates were intense, with each side passionately defending their theological positions. The Second Council of Constantinople was not merely an assembly of theologians. It was a stage upon which the complex interplay of religious doctrine, imperial power and personal ambitions played out. The stakes were incredibly high and the outcomes would resonate through the ages. It was a stage upon which the complex interplay of religious doctrine, imperial power and personal ambitions played out. The Council was a microcosm of the broader struggles within the Empire, reflecting the tensions between different factions and ideologies. Emperor Justinian I, a ruler known for his ambition and his desire to leave a lasting legacy, played a pivotal role in the Council's proceedings. His influence was felt in every decision as he sought to mould the Church to fit his vision of a unified Empire. His aim was clear, to heal the divisions within the Church and establish a unified theological front under his imperial authority. Justinian's vision was one of a cohesive and powerful Empire, with the Church serving as a cornerstone of his rule. However, the task before the Council was far from simple. The theological debates that had plagued the Church for decades were deeply entrenched, fueled by passionate convictions and personal rivalries. Each argument was a battle, each decision a potential turning point. The theological debates that had plagued the Church for decades were deeply entrenched, fueled by passionate convictions and personal rivalries. The Council members were not just debating abstract concepts, they were fighting for the soul of Christianity itself. At the heart of the controversy lay the question of Christ's nature, a question that had already sparked heated debates and led to the condemnation of Nestorianism at the Council of Ephesus in 431. This issue was more than a theological dispute. It was a matter of identity and belief for millions of Christians. The Second Council of Constantinople, therefore, stood as a pivotal moment in the history of the Church, charged with the daunting task of navigating a path through a theological minefield. The decisions made here would echo through the centuries, influencing countless generations of believers. Its decisions would have a profound and lasting impact on the Christian world, defining boundaries of orthodoxy, shaping theological discourse, and influencing the relationship between the Eastern and Western branches of Christianity for centuries to come. The legacy of the Second Council of Constantinople is a testament to the enduring power of faith and the relentless pursuit of truth. To understand the Second Council of Constantinople, one must first grasp the pivotal role of Emperor Justinian I a ruler of immense ambition and unwavering belief in his divine mandate, Justinian saw the unity of the empire as inextricably linked to the unity of the Christian faith. The theological disputes that fractured the church, therefore, represented not only religious challenges, but also threats to the stability of his reign. I see myself as a protector of orthodoxy, a defender of the true faith against heresy. Yet I recognize the need for reconciliation and compromise to heal the divisions within the church. Justinian's approach to religious matters was characterized by a blend of piety and pragmatism. This delicate balancing act was evident in his support for the Second Council of Constantinople, an assembly that he hoped would bring about the theological unity he so desired. The emperor's influence on the council was significant, shaping its agenda and influencing its decisions. He actively participated in theological debates, 
issuing edicts and corresponding with church leaders to promote his views. My primary concern is to find a formula that will appease the Monophysites without alienating the Chalcedonians. Justinian's efforts to reconcile these opposing factions, however, were met with resistance. His condemnation of the three chapters, a collection of writings by theologians suspected of Nestorian leanings, proved particularly divisive. This decision, while aimed at placating the Monophysites, alienated many bishops in the West who viewed it as an attack on the authority of the Council of Chalcedon. At the heart of the Second Council of Constantinople lay the controversy surrounding the three chapters. This council, convened in 553 AD, was a pivotal moment in the history of the early church as it sought to address and resolve deep-seated theological disputes that had been festering for decades. This term referred to the writings of three individuals, Theodore of Mopsuestia, Theodoret of Cyrus, and Ebus of Edessa, whose theological views had become entangled in the ongoing debate over the nature of Christ. These writings were seen by some as a continuation of the Nestorian heresy, which emphasized the disunion between Christ's human and divine natures. The controversy over these writings was not merely academic. It had profound implications for the unity and orthodoxy of the church. The nature of Christ was a central tenet of Christian belief, and any perceived deviation from the accepted doctrine was met with intense scrutiny and opposition. These figures, while respected for their scholarship, were suspected of harboring Nestorian sympathies, a heresy condemned at the Council of Ephesus in 431. The suspicion cast a long shadow over their works, leading to a contentious debate about their place in Christian theology. Our writings are being misinterpreted. We are not Nestorians. We uphold the true faith and the teachings of the Church. The condemnation of the three chapters was a strategic move by Justinian aimed at appeasing the Monophysites who viewed these writings as supportive of Nestorianism. Justinian, a shrewd and politically astute ruler, recognized the need to unify his empire under a single theological doctrine. By targeting these texts, Justinian sought to demonstrate his commitment to the condemnation of Nestorius and his teachings, hoping to bridge the gap between Chalcedonians and Monophysites. This was a delicate balancing act as he needed to maintain the support of both factions to ensure the stability of his reign. This condemnation undermines the authority of the Council of Chalcedon. It threatens to unravel the hard-won consensus achieved at Chalcedon, which had sought to define the nature of Christ in a way that was acceptable to both Eastern and Western branches of the Church. It is unjust and divisive. The condemnation of the three chapters has sown discord and confusion among the faithful, leading to a fracturing of the Church's unity. The condemnation of the three chapters ignited a firestorm of controversy, dividing the church along new lines. The debates were not confined to the council chambers. They spilled over into the broader Christian community, causing widespread unrest and division. Many bishops, particularly in the West, opposed the condemnation, arguing that it undermined the authority of the Council of Chalcedon, which had not explicitly condemned these writings. This opposition was not merely a matter of theological principle, it was also a defense of the integrity and autonomy of the Western Church. The controversy over the three chapters highlighted the fragility of theological unity within the Church. It exposed the deep-seated divisions that remained between Chalcedonians and Monophysites, demonstrating the difficulty of finding a formula that could reconcile these opposing views. The debates were intense and often personal, reflecting the high stakes involved in these theological disputes. The condemnation also revealed a growing rift between the eastern and western branches of the church, a rift that would widen in the centuries to come. This division was not just theological, but also cultural and political, reflecting the broader tensions within the Roman Empire. It exposed the deep-seated divisions that remained between Chalcedonians and Monophysites demonstrating the difficulty of finding a formula that could reconcile these opposing views. The debates were intense and often personal, reflecting the high stakes involved in these theological disputes. The condemnation also revealed a growing rift between the eastern and western branches of the church, a rift that would widen in the centuries to come. This division was not just theological, but also cultural and political, 
reflecting the broader tensions within the Roman Empire. The legacy of the Three Chapters controversy would be felt for generations, shaping the course of Christian history in profound ways. The Second Council of Constantinople, convened in the year 553, while primarily focused on the controversy surrounding the Three Chapters, also revisited an issue that had been at the heart of the Council of Ephesus in 431, the title of Mary as Theotokos, meaning God-bearer. This title had been a subject of intense theological debate and was crucial in defining the nature of Christ and his relationship to his mother. This title, a cornerstone of Orthodox Christology, affirmed the reality of Christ's divine and human natures, united in one person from the moment of his conception. The term Theotokos encapsulates the belief that Mary, in giving birth to Jesus, gave birth to God in the flesh, thus underscoring the unity of Christ's divine and human natures. By upholding the title of Theotokos, we reiterate the orthodox understanding of Christ's two natures united in one person, without separation or confusion. This doctrine is not merely a theological abstraction, but a profound truth that has shaped the faith and devotion of countless Christians throughout the centuries. The reaffirmation of Mary as Theotokos served as a counterpoint to the condemned Nestorian teachings which had rejected this title, arguing that Mary could only be called Christotokos, Mother of Christ, as she gave birth only to the human nature of Christ. Nestorius and his followers contended that calling Mary Theotokos implied a confusion of Christ's two natures, which they believed should be kept distinct. By upholding the title of Theotokos, the Council of Constantinople reiterated the orthodox understanding of Christ's two natures united in one person, without separation or confusion. This was a reaffirmation of the doctrine established at the Council of Ephesus, which had declared that Jesus Christ is one person in two natures, fully divine and fully human. This doctrine emphasizes the unity of Christ's person, highlighting the fact that from the moment of his conception in Mary's womb, he was both fully God and fully human. The Annunciation, when the angel Gabriel announced to Mary that she would conceive and bear a son, is a pivotal moment in this understanding, as it marks the beginning of the Incarnation. This doctrine had profound implications for the understanding of salvation, for it was through the Incarnation, the union of God and humanity in the person of Jesus Christ, that humanity could be reconciled to God. The belief that God became man in the person of Jesus is central to Christian soteriology as it underscores the means by which salvation is accomplished. The Council of Constantinople's stance on Mary as Theotokos was therefore not merely a matter of Marian devotion, it was a crucial affirmation of the orthodox understanding of Christ's nature and the significance of the Incarnation for the salvation of humanity. This title for Mary is deeply intertwined with the Church's Christological doctrines, reflecting the belief that Jesus Christ is both fully God and fully man. It served as a reminder of the interconnectedness of Christological and Marian doctrines, demonstrating how the Church's understanding of Mary's role was inextricably linked to its understanding of her son's identity and mission. The title of Theotokos is not just an honorific for Mary. It is a declaration of the mystery of the Incarnation and the profound truth of God's love for humanity manifested in the person of Jesus Christ.